Well, we are thinking about verses uh, 13 and 14. We've been going through this great anthem of praise of Paul's from verse 13 to 14. And we've come to verse 13 and 14 um, uh, this morning, and we're going to read them together. Where Paul says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, why is it that we feel in such awe and so inspired by people who are famous and, or celebrities, figures of royalty? Um, over this past week, I've been going through in my mind all of the famous people that I've bumped into in this life. And I've not really had uh, much real personal contact with any of them, not at least when they were famous. But, but I did grow up with uh, Johnny Mercer, who is the MP for Plymouth View Moor. Um, he served as a captain in the army in Afghanistan. He's written the book, When We Were Warriors. And he's been described by some as a rising star of the Conservative Party, perhaps one day tipped to become Prime Minister, and I can remember cycling on my bike round his back garden when I was younger. I've played five-a-side football before with Rory Graham. That doesn't mean anything to you, does it? Who would become the rag and bone man? That might mean something more to you. Uh, while on work experience, GCSEs, I went to Eric Clapton's house and waved at him from a distance. I, I've stood next to Jane Torville in Clinton Cards in Tunbridge Wells. I've inadvertently headbutted the former boxer Chris Eubank in Brighton, who looked down at me with his monocle. Scary time. Uh, I found myself within a few feet of the ex-Liverpool footballer Stephen Gerrard in an airport in Portugal. I've shaken hands with Steve Cram, uh, the former ru runner who came to visit our school. I've walked past the actress Kate Blanchett, who currently lives in Crowborough. And uh, I've also seen from a distance Elvis Presley's daughter, who also used to live very near Crowborough. Aren't I privileged? Contact with a few famous people, but all very much at a distance. And I suspect that you've got your own stories about even more famous people that you've had far more meaningful contact with. But, but when you see famous people in the flesh, people that you only ever see on TV, it does something to you inside, doesn't it? Uh, it makes you take notice. You stop. You nudge the person next to you. You say, look at that. I can't believe it. It's them. Uh, you go up and you introduce yourself to them if you're feeling brave. You get a selfie with them. Back in the day, you get their autograph and then sell it maybe. Um, you'd get the selfie and then you'd post it up on Facebook. Uh, you'd get home to your family and friends and you'd say, guess who I met and spoke to today? And the reason why people have this reaction is because we were created to worship and we were designed to recognize and to be stirred by greatness. And when on those rare occasions we find ourselves in the presence of, of superstars or of members of the royal family, we are filled with wonder that these people with, with whom we attribute a form of glory that they should ever be mixing with people like us. And yet, of course, if we are stirred to recognize someone's greatness, if we see a famous person in the street at a distance, how much more should we be stirred to praise verse 3, verse 6, verse 12, and verse 14, the God of the universe, the God who is three persons in one, Father, Son, and Spirit, whom we haven't just glimpsed his majesty from a distance, but who has wonderfully come and been close and personal with us. And so in verses 3 to 6, our hearts should be stirred to honor God the Father, who out of his love for us has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing found in heavenly places who has loved us and chosen us before time began and who made it our destiny to one day be part of his family. And then we move on to verses 12, 7 to 12 and we should be stirred to, to honour and recognise the greatness of God's Son 
who, because of his great love for us, purchased us on the cross and redeemed us, and who through him we have the forgiveness of sins and have obtained an inheritance. And as we come to verses 13 and 14, we find that it's not just God the Father and God the Son who has brought themselves to be intimately involved in our lives and who's who's done great and eternal things for us. But no, God the Holy Spirit has done these things as well. And it's my prayer today that Paul's anthem of praise will cause us to worship not just God the Father, Not just God the Son, but God the Holy Spirit as well. Now, if you look in verse 13, it describes something that happened when these people from Ephesus believed. So they heard the message of truth, which Paul explains here is the good news of how to be saved through Jesus. They have believed and put their hopes and their confidence in Jesus. And Paul says that when they believed... Something happened. Obviously, God, the Holy Spirit, had already been uh, working in their lives uh, for them to be brought to this point of faith. But Paul says when they they were brought, brought to this point of faith in Christ, something happened. He says that they were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, there are three things that Paul says here about the Holy Spirit, and we're going to look at each one of them. And the first is that the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, was promised. God the Holy Spirit was promised. Uh, Paul describes him here as the promised Holy Spirit. Now, if you ever want to see contrasting reactions amongst a group of different people, you can do it through two ways. Uh, One, you can get them to taste Marmite. Um, That will give you a contrasting reaction. Another way is to just simply share with them how many days there is until Christmas. Okay, If you share with them how many days there is until Christmas, some will feel really happy and some will inwardly groan inside because uh, Christmas is coming round again. But of course, Christmas is the time when we especially remember God's Son coming to this world. And in our Christmas services, our carol services, we read the verses from the Old Testament that contain these promises about, about what would happen and, and where it would happen and, and who this special person would be. And as we get the tinsel out, we put the decorations up and we stand the tree in the corner and we hang the chocolates and the lights on the tree and we send cars to each other and we give our gifts to one another uh, What we're saying is, and what we're celebrating really, is that God has fulfilled his promise. The promise of his son coming. Jesus born in Bethlehem, brought up in Nazareth, and living in Galilee. And as we read through the Gospels, we're struck afresh by the wonder of the fact that God has kept his promise and his son has come. How he lived among us and listened to us and taught us and talked to us. How he had compassion on us and performed miracles and displayed his glory. And it was all so wonderful, God the Son coming as God had promised and living among humanity. But there were other promises in the Old Testament as well, weren't there? Promises not just about God the Son coming, but promises about God the Holy Spirit coming as well. Significant promises. For example, in Joel 2 and verses 28 and 29, uh, the the apostles, they pick this up as an important passage in the book of Acts. We find the promise of God to pour out his spirit one day on all of his people in a way that he'd never done before. In Ezekiel 36, another significant promise. God promised there to to wash the hearts of his people and take away their stony dead hearts and give them a new heart and to put his spirit within them. And then you come into the New Testament in the time of Jesus and the promises about the Holy Spirit, they gather pace. 
So in Matthew 3, you find John the Baptist saying that Jesus is going to baptize his people with the Holy Spirit. In John 7, at the, the Feast of Tabernacles, you remember, remember how Jesus, he, he cried out for anyone who thirsted to come to him, and then he looked forward to God, the Holy Spirit, coming to, uh, to, to dwell in our hearts. In John 14 to 16, Jesus keeps promising that God, the Holy Spirit, is coming. In fact, Jesus is saying, I must go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't, won't come. And it's actually better for you that the Holy Spirit comes. In Luke 24 and verse 49, Jesus says that he's going to send the promise of his Father upon his disciples. He's referring to the Spirit there, it's clear. And then again in Acts 1, Jesus tells his disciples just before he ascends to go to Jerusalem and wait in Jerusalem until the promise of my Father comes upon you. And of course, again, it's clear he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. God kept his promise. A God fulfilled the promise that the Holy Spirit would come and be poured out on all of God's people. Now, because one of the particular works of the Holy Spirit is really to, to turn the light of God's glory away from himself and to aim the spotlight of God's glory on Jesus so everyone is directed to Jesus, because of that, often we can almost forget about the Holy Spirit. And because of that, I think we can view him as a less important person within the Trinity. Now, I'm not saying that annually around the day of Pentecost, we should send cards to each other and give gifts and put up decorations and things like that. But what I am saying is that we should never take the Holy Spirit for granted. And, and, and we should never treat him as if he is a lesser member of the Trinity. A God the Spirit is as important as God the Father and God the Son. And I wonder whether you worship him and you love him. And you thank God that he has kept his promise to send the Spirit. Uh, secondly, we see that God the Holy Spirit is a seal. God the Holy Spirit is a seal. Paul says that when these people from Ephesus put their faith in Christ, they were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He refers to it again in chapter 4 and verse 30. They've been sealed by the Spirit. Now, for the younger ones this morning who were in the service, I uh, clarified for them that when the Bible talks about a seal, it doesn't usually mean the animal that swims in the sea. And the reason why I did that is because for years, that's what I thought it meant. And so when you came to Revelation uh, 5 and 6, and you had this book with seven seals, and the seven seals were opened, I felt quite disturbed by it. No, in the ancient world, a seal was a stamp We've got a picture of them up there by which you put a personalized mark on something. So it might be a small cylinder made out of a stone or metal with a, a personalized emblem or engraving on it, which you could use to make an impression in clay that would have your mark on it. Or a king might have a ring or a signet ring with his own personal um, emblem on it, and he could press it into wax and leave his personal sign. And there were at least three things that a seal was used for in first century Rome. One was it provided proof of ownership. It's a bit like branding cattle. So a farmer might brand his cattle today, and we know that it bears the farmer's mark. We know who the cattle belong to. So if you had brought something in the marketplace, but you had no way to take it home at that time, you could put your seal on it and come back for it and prove that it was yours because it had your mark on it. A second thing it did was to show that something was genuine or authentic. So a letter sealed with wax bearing the mark of the king's ring showed that the letter truly was from the palace. It was genuine. 
And then the third thing that a seal often did was it provided security. So thieves were less likely to steal something that was marked by someone's seal because it would be harder to sell. Now the Bible clearly teaches that God has spiritually stamped all of his people with a seal. The Bible clearly teaches that God has spiritually stamped all of his people with a seal. He has put this distinguishing feature on them that marks them out from everyone else. And you find when you come to Revelation, especially chapter 7 and chapter 9, that this is particularly important because when you come to the great day of judgment, it's only those who have been stamped, who have been marked by God's seal, who are kept secure and safe. I think in Paul's mind here, where he talks about a seal, he's thinking particularly more about proof of ownership and proof of authenticity. And he said, well, what is the distinguishing feature that marks out Christians from those who aren't Christians that show that they belong to God? Uh, You can read a whole range of different uh, thoughts. I've been doing that this week, been very enjoyable. Uh, some would particularly say that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a special one-off experience that is given to you by God to really affirm in your heart and assure you that you are his child and, and that you belong to him. But I, I think actually it's very simply what Paul says here. The seal is the Holy Spirit himself. The mark that, the, that God puts on the believer, the distinguished distinguishing feature of the Christian is the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit ongoingly in their life. So for example, how do you know that you are a real and genuine, authentic Christian? How do you know that? Uh, Maybe that's been a question that you've been thinking about struggling with recently for yourself. How, How do I know that I really am an authentic Christian? Well, what assurance do I have? Well, Paul, he seems to skip over the details here, but he does tell us in Romans 8 and verses 15 and 16. Romans 8 and verses 15 and 16. Let me read those verses to you. He's talking, he's writing to believers, and he says to them there, he says that, he says, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. Uh, beforehand, he, he will have said that, that, that when, when the Spirit came to you, you knew that you were no longer an orphan, but you were a child of a father. So, so when you believed and you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, what, what happened in that moment? Well, actually, you found that your whole relationship with God was turned upside down. And you found that you suddenly started to relate to God, not as this distant judge, but as your father in heaven. You started to uh, respond to him as if you were his child. And this wasn't something that you had manufactured or put on. It, it had just happened. And you say, well, well, how did that happen? How did I suddenly start to relate to God as Father? Well, it was the Holy Spirit in your heart that was making you think and respond and feel like that. And I want you to see the love of, of God in this. If you are a believer, if you have put your faith in Jesus, he wants you to know. He wants you to be assured that you belong to him. He's given you the Holy Spirit as this seal to mark you out and to show that you are an authentic child of God. But then we go on because I think there is more to this than just this recognition that God is our Heavenly Father. I think that actually by implication Paul is alluding to it here. Uh, How else do I know that I belong to God and I'm God's possession? Or how else do I know that someone else belongs to God? That's important to know, isn't it? How how do I know that someone else is a Christian? That they are God's possession, that that they belong to God? What proof of ownership is on them? 
Uh, 1 John was a letter written specifically so that Christians might know that they belong to God. It was written to assure them. And in that letter, John gives three tests that you can apply so that you can be assured that you are a Christian. So firstly, does a person have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and God? Does someone have faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and God? Secondly, does someone truly love God's people as their new family? Is there this God-given love in their hearts in a way that was never there before for their brothers and sisters now in Christ? That's the second test. And then a third test is, is someone keeping God's commands and living a righteous life? And not a perfect life, but a righteous life. All of which John makes very clear again and again in his letter, all those three things, they are impossible without the work of the Spirit in someone's heart. And you notice what Paul does in verses 15 and 16. We didn't read these verses But look at verses 15 and 16. In verse 16, Paul, he tells these people that he just can't stop giving thanks to God for them. He just can't stop giving thanks to God for them. Every time he prays about them, every time he remembers them, he says, thank you, Lord, for them. Now, why can't he stop giving thanks to God for them? Well, it's very obvious. It's because he knows that they belong to God. He knows that they are God's possession. He knows that they are truly Christians. And you say, well, how does he know this? What proofs of ownership has he identified which have showed him that these people are God's possession, that God has purchased them? Well, he tells us in verse 15. Think of that first test in John. He says, I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus. Think about the second test in John and all your your love for all of God's people. He will go on to talk about living a righteous life in chapter 4 in relation to the Spirit. You see, God had marked these people by his seal. He had given the Holy Spirit to them, and the Holy Spirit was in their hearts, and they were producing these proofs of ownership. You know, when God the Son came as promised, he came to live among us, and it was wonderful. And yet, you know, when God the Holy Spirit came as promised, he came not to live among us, he came to live within us. How amazing is that? That when you put your faith in Jesus, the God of heaven came to live in your heart. We sing, King of kings, majesty, God of heaven living in me. In 2 Corinthians 1, Paul will say that God has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts. I don't know whether you saw a story on the BBC about a woman lived in America. She'd been adopted when she was a young child And then back in 2011, she tried to research her family history. And she found out that she had a half-sister that she had never been aware of. And she wanted to find her half-sister. It was important to her. And so she, she looked everywhere. She looked all through the records. She searched through all the databases. But she couldn't find her sister. And then in 2017, some people came and moved into the house next door to her with which she shared a driveway. And to her disbelief, after some time, she discovered that a new next door neighbor was none other than the sister that she'd been looking for. And for some time at least, they'd been living next door to each other without realizing You know, if you are a believer, the most important person in the whole universe has not come to live in the house next door. The most important person in the universe has come to make his home in your heart. We get all excited, don't we, about catching a glimpse of someone who pretends to be famous in the street from a distance. 
and yet we lose the wonder of having the God of glory, the Father and the Son by his Spirit with us for the whole time. You imagine the queen and the thought of her coming to live with you in your tiny little bedsit or your uh, house, uh, your tiny little house which is probably in need of decoration, which is a bit of a mess. You've still got the washing up to do when you go back. You have things all over the place because you haven't tidied for a few days. Parking out on the road is a bit of a nightmare. Where on earth is she going to put a golden carriage uh, all the neighbors are noisy. You perhaps live in a bit of a, uh, a rough neighborhood, perhaps. Uh, quite a downgrade to Buckingham Palace. And yet here is God the Spirit, the God of heaven, and he has come to make his home in you. Who is it that makes you know that you're God's child? Who is it that helps you to pray? Well, when you pray, who's helping you to do that? Who's inspiring you to do that? Who is it that helps you to understand God's word? Who is it that applies it to your heart? Who is it that produces fruit in your life? Who is it that comforts you when you're hurt? Who is it that makes you take hold of the promises of God? Who is it that convicts you of your sin that needs to be repented? Who is it that shows you your need of God's righteousness? Who is it that helps you to keep God's commands? Who is it that puts a love for God's family in your soul? Who is it that leads you and prompts you and guides you? Who is it that loves you so much that he's come to make his home in you? Who is it that is with you wherever you go and whatever you go through? Who is it that is your helper and your comforter and your best friend? It is God the Holy Spirit who God has set in a seal in your life. And so we see finally that God, the Holy Spirit, is a guarantee. He is a guarantee. Verse 14, he is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. You remember that reference in 2 Corinthians 1, God has given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 5, as Paul is looking forward to his heavenly home and inheritance, he says that God has given us the Spirit as a guarantee of it. Now, the word guarantee means down payment, it means deposit, pledge. It's like receiving an upfront payment in advance of the full sum of money that will one day come your way. So think of it in two ways. Think of it firstly as a deposit. A deposit. If, if, if you're selling your house for someone to purchase it, you insist that first of all they pay a deposit. Now that's always part of the uh, transaction and the process. And there's always this massive sigh of relief when you get to the point in this long-winded process when this solicitor informs you that the deposit has been paid, the transaction has come through. And, and the reason why that is a sigh of relief to you to you because, because the deposit is usually a large enough sum to guarantee that the sale will go through and the whole amount will be received. Because the buyer must be pretty serious about it to put down that size of deposit. What is the inheritance that God is going to give to his people? The Bible teaches clearly that it's God himself. God in all of his fullness I listened to Asaph in Psalm 73. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those will be two great verses to have on your gravestone. You know, God must be extremely serious about you acquiring your full inheritance if he's already given you the deposit of the Holy Spirit in your heart. He's guaranteed it. Secondly, think of it as a foretaste. Think of it as a foretaste. 
Uh, we had a, a wedding here with Richard and Kate being married, and it was a, a great day. And, uh, and one of the things that a couple might do in preparation for their wedding is to go and visit different venues to see which ones they like best. And often what will happen is the venue will let you have a tiny taste of what you might be able to expect and look forward to if you were to book the reception with them. And so they might kind of sit you down at a nicely laid out table and they might bring you a tiny taste of the starter, whether it's prawn cocktail or uh, Thai style fish cakes or slow roasted beetroot salad. Uh, And then perhaps after that, they might bring you a tiny sample of the main course, whether it'll be roast duck or roast lamb or roast beef with roast potato. And they might bring you some of the vegetables and they bring out the the, the gravy, which is is hot and steaming. And they're pouring the gravy over this sumptuous little meal. And you try that. You put some of the the meat and the sauce and the potato on your fork and you you smell it all and you taste it all. And, And then after that, they might bring you out a small example of what you might have for pudding, whether it's summer baked peaches with honey Greek yogurt or meringue filled with strawberries and cream and a rich chocolate sauce, and you can taste some of that. And, and then perhaps they let you have a tiny taste and sample of what champagnes that you might toast the speeches to or the different wines that you might enjoy with your meal. And of course, the whole idea is, is that they want you to think that if this tiny sample that they are offering you is this good, imagine what the whole banquet is going to be like. Imagine when you're here with this amazing feast and all of your friends and your family and the happy chatter and conversation and you're all enjoying this amazing abundance of food and that's the picture here. The God, the Holy Spirit given to us in our hearts is a foretaste of our heavenly inheritance. He is, if you like, the first course of the sumptuous spiritual banquet that we're going to enjoy in heaven. I mean, if you are blown away by the thought that the God of heaven is living by his spirit in your heart, and he prays for you, and he loves you, and he comforts you, and he assures you of his promises, and his care, and he's with you all of the time, and he directs you towards the Lord Jesus Christ, and his glory, and his cross, and his grace, what's it going to be like when you're with God in a way that you've never experienced before? When instead of needing to be directed by the Spirit in faith to Jesus through the Word, you see Jesus face to face. You know, I think there is a momentum in this great anthem of praise from verse 3 to 14. We, we tend to be blown away more by the blessings that are highlighted to do with the Father and the Son. And we kind of think that the Spirit's blessings, they're a bit of a kind of a, a, a come down. It's not so exciting. It's just a, a conclusion. But actually, I think it's the other way around. I think these verses, they are building up in momentum. And as Paul is writing this great song of praise, he comes to this crescendo I think we're supposed to be amazed at the thought of God the Father choosing us and loving us from before time began. I think we are to be blown away by the thought that God the Son should come and die for us and purchase us with his blood. But I think we are to be unable to take it in the thought that God should come and live in my little heart. Verse 14 is telling us that in some ways heaven has already begun for the believer. But verse 14 is also telling us that there is so much more to look forward to. If you think that it's amazing that God has made his home in your heart, think about what it's going to be like when he takes you home to be with him. Are you looking forward to heaven? Are you looking forward to heaven? It will be all to the praise of God's glory if you're there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you did not just send your son. 
we thank you so much that you sent the Spirit. We pray that you'd forgive us when we get things out of kilter, when we perhaps forget the Spirit or ignore the Spirit or treat the Spirit as a, a lesser important person within the Trinity, when we treat him lightly, when we are not concerned about the state of the home that he is living in, when we grieve him. Father, we thank you for the Spirit. We love the Spirit. And we thank you that the Spirit enables us to enjoy your love for us. And we thank you for these foretastes of heaven that you give to us through him. We thank you for the full inheritance that you have prepared for your people when you will give yourself to us in a way that we have never known before. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would help us never to take um, you as Father and Son and Spirit for granted, but that we would always worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.